Welcome to another episode of Grief Talk. Everything you want to know about grief and more. I'm your host, Vaughn Solis. As an author, life transformation coach, online instructor, and bereaved mom since 2005, I'll be bringing you great content that is informative, inspiring, and practical. Whether you have suffered a loss or other adversity, stay tuned and tapped in as I cover a variety of topics to help you get where you want to go on your journey to heal and grow. Today's guest is Joe McQuillan. Joe is married for 31 years and a father of three children, one son on the other side. The youngest of 10 children from an Irish Catholic family, Joe is at heart a blue-collar kid from Buffalo, New York. Not willing to accept a world devoid of his beloved son, Christopher, Joe began to research the metaphysical and seek out the answers to what happens next. With a desire to bring other bereaved parents comfort and hope through all of his work, his first book, written by Joe and Chris, My Search for Christopher on the Other Side, tells the story of the journey of discovery over Joe's first two years. His second book, We're Not Done Yet, Pop, My Lessons from the Other Side, takes his audience to the next level of discovery and awakening. Welcome to the show, Joe. I have been so excited to talk to you. And if you just want to pop in for a quick moment and say hello to the audience, they'll get to see uh, your bright and shining face. And then we're, we're going to get on to the episode. I don't know how bright or shiny it is, but it's my face. And I'm Joe McQuillan, and I'm an author and a bereaved uh, uh, shining light parent. Exactly. So um, as I mentioned uh, in the introduction uh, for my uh, audience, um, Joe has a son on the other side, and uh, I have a daughter on the other side. And Joe and I have many similarities. We've never met before, so this is our first time meeting as well. And um, so, uh, but what we do have in common, and I believe that um, we're all brought together at the times we're brought together for a reason, and I'll be honest, I started this podcast uh, uh, in July, Joe, and, uh, and for my audience. And it is dedicated, just like your work, uh, to helping bereaved parents and other bereaved individuals and anybody who feels lost and is struggling from adversity um, heal, choose to grow, and expand their consciousness. And so a large part of the work that you do uh, obviously, if, if not all of the work that you do, and we're going to get into that in just a, a moment, but for the audience is that uh, Joe does receive visits, messages from Christopher, his son Christopher, who passed in, in January 2016. Uh, and, and came to you fairly quickly uh, after um, his passing with messages, all kinds of messages about his experience, what it's like in the afterlife, and so on. Uh, my daughter and I have been silent about this for most of my 17 years in bereavement because I'm an angel uh, therapy practitioner. And so when I started channeling uh, right away, because the question we have in common, and Joe's going to agree with this and has talked about this, you want to know where your kid is. In fact, you want to know where any loved one is when they die. And it is a scientific challenge to figure this out. But for those of us who are lucky enough to receive visits, Joe and I here uh, are here today to not offer you proof, but to offer you experience and I'm so thrilled you're here, Joe, because for a long time I felt so alone and I think I was a little bit hesitant. Uh, I was even hesitant to, um, you know, sort of go public with working and channeling angels. So to bring in my daughter, who I don't believe we're channeling, but we're, we're communicating, we're connecting with them in a form that we don't even really necessarily understand. You know, it was so new for me and so overwhelming for me. And because I'd been involved in metaphysics, maybe I was already wide open to receive this type of communication, but not having done it before, this is what was sort of overwhelming for me. So anyway, I got braver and braver through my first few few years of bereavement to speak openly about angels. And in fact, I worked one-on-one -on -one channeling messages and, you know, healing sessions for many clients. And I wrote in my first book all about how my daughter actually aided me. But I'm telling you, those visits, Joe, somewhat kept me alive, okay? Because they gave me hope. And we're going to dive into your story and how you came to be blessed uh, to have visits. I call them visits. I'll let you explain in your words what you call them. 
but it's the connecting with our children when they're gone. And why this is so important for you and I to be talking together is because when one parent goes out and and talks about it and says, well, this is happening, you tend, it, it almost tends to be a voyeurism. The others look and go, oh, I wish I could do that. They can do it, but I'll never be able to do it. And it's something that unless you experience it, it's kind of hard to, you can't teach it. You just have to be open to it. And so it's for those people, and I had plenty of bereaved parents over the years who have said to me, I wish I had visits. I wish I had signs. I wish I had this. And often parents, I also want to remind any uh, bereaved parent watching, Joe will attest to this as well. You know what? The signs and the connection may well be there and you're just missing it because of doubts. So we're going to get into that in a little bit too. But first, Joe, also deepest, deepest condolences to you, your wife, I believe her name's Sally, and your surviving children and all other family members. From one bereaved parent to another, I, I know that you know the uh, depth of that uh, statement, and um, it is from my heart to all of you that I am sorry for the human experience that you're having to go through, like me. Thank you, and, <laughs> and right back... Uh, Right back at you with your loss as well. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, bereaved parents love that when we say that to each other. It's just it's, it kind of binds you and bonds you, I guess I should say. And it's a, it's an amazing. Um, it's, we're all it's in amazing. this together. We're in, we're we're on the same team, same choir, same team. So over to you, Joe. And uh, so because I have a lot of questions I want to get to, I will I will absolutely just to drum up some conversation here and get people thinking about different things and even ourselves. Uh, I would invite you to explain to the audience uh, the work that you are doing, your focus and the work that you're doing, and and obviously how you came to do it. Well, let's Thank start you. with let's start with uh, you know in January third, uh, two thousand sixteen. Chris was home from college and. Uh, Last weekend before they were going back to school from Christmas break and and they uh they all were meeting up at a friend's lake house in in Wisconsin about an hour and a half away and 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 Chris was wild. You know, he gets that for me. I'm 37 years sober. I was I was a bit of a wild man growing up and uh and and so Sally and I were kind of relieved that he was going to be in this bucolic setting up in up in the woods and safe and and the plan was they were all going to go to a tavern, shoot a bunch. But there's a dozen of them. Shoot pool, come back to the house, finish the party, get up in the morning, and everybody go home. And then, you know, a couple of the day or two later, go back to school. And that was the plan, you know. And uh, and so I grew up in Buffalo, and I was a big Buffalo Bills fan. And I, you know, I always I have a dish, so we've always watched Bills games together when he's in town with his little brother. And, and, and I woke up and, and he wasn't around. And around 11 o'clock, I started texting. Hey, hey, where are you, pal? And the game's going to kick off in 45 minutes or whatever. And I get a text back from one of the boys. It said, Mr. McHugh, Chris and three of his friends, three of our friends is missing. So, you know, I jumped into the Jeep and threw my, uh, you know, threw a pair of hunting boots on, grabbed my dog and started driving up and halfway up, I got a phone call and said from the uncle who lived in the a couple of houses down that said it was no longer a search, but a recovery. All, all, all four boys had drowned. And, and, and literally every parent, uh, every parent goes back to that moment, you know, and, uh, and literally I felt a little bit in shock. And, and so I drove up and, uh, and I, I look out the window, I, out my window that I'm talking to it now. I'm in his bedroom that we is now my home office. Mm -hmm. It was his bedroom as a kid, and it's a very happy place, you know, a thin place for me. Mm -hmm. And I could look out the window and see the flashing lights and the divers and all that stuff that goes with it. And, it. and it breaks your heart all over again. No, it doesn't break it out. No. And there's a great line from movie Manchester by the Sea, where a woman lost a couple her children in a fire tragically. And she said, my heart was broken. It'll always be broken. And that's the way it is. You know, I live a very full life full of love and laughter, but I do it with a piece of my heart broken. And, and, you know, I was just watching, believe it or not, a show called Yellowstone yesterday. Mm -hmm. And, and Kevin Costner had lost a son and he approached his daughter-in-law who had lost a baby and said, I know how you feel. You know, 
I wished I didn't, but I do. And there yeah. was such a concise statement. So anybody listening, I know how you feel. Yeah. When outsiders say that it doesn't have it, 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 it I almost dismiss it because no, you don't. I mean, it would be like me saying, I know what it's like to wake up as an amputee and, and I don't, mm -hmm. but I do know what it's like to wake up and realize that you're, you're facing another day and your son's crossed over. So, um, you know, flashback 15 years, I had seen a medium, kind of a spiritual whim, maybe. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't very significant. At the very end, she got to the point and she said, your dad's here. He's saying railroad showing a caboose. And, and I stopped because my dad was a railroader for 40 years. All five boys in the family worked on the railroad in college. My uncle, my grandfather, we were a railroad family. So at that point, I said, huh, that's interesting. And I put filed that away in my mental file cabinet that said my dad somewhere that's that it's attainable where you can connect to you know you can reach him you can touch him but he didn't die tragically or or out of order really a little earlier than we'd like but there was no sense of urgency and 15 years later i'm driving up to wisconsin and there is yeah and i got the message and i'm kind of in shock a little bit and it came to me that if my dad was somewhere and chris is with him you know, that's how my family was big Irish Catholic family, 10 kids, big family. So if, if dad was somewhere, he was with Chris now when Chris crossed over. And that started my search, you know, Vaughn, that was that was the moment that I said, there was that moment that I said, I need to try to figure this out. And by the way, I mean, I spent 30 years, I was a car dealer. I'm, 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 mm -hmm. I'm a blue collar guy. I'm a yeah, Who's on the ground fella. Yeah. You know, I stopped playing hockey three years ago, two years ago, you know, so I'm not a gullible guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought, OK, if this is new age hokey BS, let's cross it off the list and figure some way else to to, you know, to see what's there. And mm -hmm. and that started my search. Well, obviously, you know, what I learned was it's not hokey BS, that it's that that that. The other side is just a rice paper wall away that they can connect with us. You and I were briefly talking before and you were talking about parents who say, you know, gee, you can do it, but I can't. You can. And, and, and you're a very kind and sweet woman. And I remember speaking at a, at a group in Wilmette Theater and somebody kind of in an accusatory way was like, well, my my sister passed and I haven't heard from her. And, mm. and I said, what have you done? You know, what have you done on your part? Because you've mm -hmm. got to do your part, right? Yes. I had to learn to raise my level of consciousness. I had to learn yes. how to align my chakras. I had to learn how to meditate. You know, yes. I'm an yes. A personality, ADD guy. Yeah. Yep. I don't sit still, but I do when I meditate. I also want to just add in here. I might I might do that sometimes, um, uh, Joby, because uh, I get flashes of information. Imagine doing this audience when you are suffering the worst pain you can go through sure opening up your chakras trusting it's easy to it's easy to hope and 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 have the willingness okay and the, it's almost a desperation for me it was a desperation and i'll just throw in there so at the time my daughter died i had 27 years of metaphysics behind me and it, one of my favorite books was Gary, Zuk, Gary Zukov's Seat of the Soul. And I had to get that book out again. I had to get all my books out again and reread them because now it held very different meaning for me. Because it's okay to sit there and be, and uh, with no disrespect to the leaders of metaphysics, spiritual, you know, movements and, well, not movements, but, you know, thought and, you know, the, the big time authors and so on. I always have said to my uh, family, I would love to sit at a dinner table and ask if they would espouse so easily and quickly the same thing if they had lost a child. But of course, that's probably never going to happen. So the reason I'm jumping in and just saying that is it takes willpower just to get yourself out of bed. Never mind open yourself up to learning, channeling, you know, be, because you're always every day having having to put more on yourself to be more. Would you not agree with that, Joe? I would, Vaughn, but it's a whole other story. In other words, for me, it was air to breathe. Mm. So mm. 
Mm-hmm. If I needed, you know, in my grief, in my grief, mm-hmm. I needed to learn how to connect. Now, if you said in my grief, you had to learn French. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Accounting, you yeah. know, I would yeah. blow it off because I yeah. didn't care. But, yeah. the, but what was most important in the world to me mm-hmm. was connecting. You know, there's. Yes. Now, I don't look like a guy that would quote Aeschylus, you know, a Greek uh, uh, philosopher, but he said, in our sleep, pain that cannot forgets falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our misery mm-hmm. and against our own will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. I mean, awful, not in as terrible, but awesome, awful as an awe-inspiring, this awful strength, mm-hmm. the awesome strength that, that the God has. And wisdom has in some way push some of the grief, you know, let's be honest. I, I grieve every yeah. day. There's always something that takes my knees out once a day. Mm. I process it. I let it flow over me. And then I get on my day. Mm-hmm. I know my Christopher is with me, mm-hmm. you know, and that prevents me from going into a shell that I can't get out of, you know, yeah. two things. One, Chris is in my daily life. Yeah. And, and two, when I cross, which I will, I'm going to be with him. Mm-hmm. I know that. I mean, I went from a believing to knowing. So let me touch on that a little bit. Mm-hmm. My wife, Sally's on board with the same, you know, she's a beautiful, wonderful. She's a very, very bright. She's a therapist. You know, she's a magnificent gal and she's completely on board with what, you know, as a matter of fact, she went and saw Rebecca Rosen before I did or before mm-hmm. I, I got heavily involved in this and it encouraged me to, to pick up the mantle and, and keep moving. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had called this medium that I had spoken to 15 years before after Chris transitioned really, really soon. And she said, I I don't know if he'll be able to come through because it's so soon, but he did. Mm -hmm. And he told us things that we didn't know until we got to, I didn't know until we got the coroner's report and such. And, and it was some good readings and some understanding. Like one of the things she said, he's calling you a different name than dad. It's like, Mm -hmm. pap or pip i said no that's pop he would call me pop you know yeah and when he was playing it was pop when it was serious it was dead you know and that continues to this day yeah but then i went to another level where i thought i can't call this woman back every you know three weeks you know and a good medium will say that yes that's right and and she said you know so so I wanted to, I decided there's a wonderful book by a guy named Bob Olson. It's an answers to the afterlife. He was a private investigator and a guy's guy. And, mm. and so I really wanted his bent. I didn't want flowing robes. I didn't want tambourines. I wanted <laughs> you know, somebody with boots on the ground telling me what to expect. Yeah. So his book was phenomenal. And on that book was a website that I didn't realize was his, you know, a website about mediums in your area. So I looked up the mediums and I picked up this guy named uh, Thomas or Andrew Anderson. Mm-hmm. And, and and Andrew lived in about 40 minutes away in the West suburbs of Chicago mm-hmm. and I gave him my first name, nothing else made an appointment. Mm-hmm. And like I always do, I have an exit, you know, ramp that, you know, if I was going to you know disappear, yeah. not yeah. show up, I'd cancel. Um, so I, this, this was June uh, 30th, 2016, six months after Christopher transition. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I went and saw Andrew, but before I did, I did two things. One is I took this, bracelet it's a leather bracelet from disney world in 2000 well christopher was uh so this must have been 90 99 probably 2000 so he's five six and he gave it to me and and i put it in my dresser and never thought of it after that week right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and another thing is i had done i had moved him over one grave and i think your <laughs> listeners are going to think i lost left the reservation but when the snow melted it was obvious that he was buried next to another couple, even though we had had three plots and, and I was livid, you know, he was my kid. Nobody else's that, you know, the stone wasn't down until the, the ground softened. So mm-hmm. I moved him over one plot and I'll occupy the plot he was in. That's my plot. But I, you know, he was my kid, nobody else's. So, uh, and by the way, that decision came to me um, like a mandate. Mm. I kept trying to think of, you know, the human rationale. Well, I'm wasting money. Is this really important? Isn't this better for his kids' school? Whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. And I just kept getting the answer: move him, move mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And I did. And I, I'm, it's one of the finest things I've ever done because I'm perfectly content when I go there, which I go there often. 
you know. So do you think the the quote mandate to to move it was to bring you contentment or did you ever find another yeah that was it? Okay. It was when I go there and it's mm. perfect. Mm. And it wouldn't have been perfect. I would have been settling. Yes. And I don't yes. want to settle when it's dealing with something as important as connecting with my kid. So yes. I'm happy. I'm not second guessing it, right? And so uh, it was a it was a great move. So the, they had moved. They had done. Re, they moved them over in May, and uh, they had moved them over in May. And so the dirt was loose around his grave. Mm -hmm. So I planted shamrock seeds that I would ordered from Amazon. They had gotten in a couple of days before. I didn't even tell my wife I was planting shamrock. Now it's not what I'm hiding planting shamrock. It just didn't come up, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, I had worked later and got in and. Boom. You know, so in the morning I said, oh, I'm going to do two things. I grabbed the bracelet, put it on my wrist under my cuff and then stopped at the grave and planted the shamrock seeds and talked to Chris a little bit and jumped in the car, went and sent Andrew Anderson and, and, you know, walked in it's for it's the first time in a long time, other, you know, then 15 years before when I'd seen a medium in person that I was in, in front of a medium, but I wanted to talk to somebody who was looking at my son. Mm hmm. And, 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 and I knew that I would know. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there are, there's, everybody has this aha moment where you go from believing to knowing. And this yes. was my aha moment. Mm -hmm. I walked in and he talked about a couple of things. He asked for a couple of pictures of who I wanted to connect to them. Showed Chris, you know, at a you know, Blackhawks game and Chris at a party in Hawaiian shirt. And he had mentioned, he said, you know, there was a sadness about him. We did. We knew that there mm -hmm. was a, a depression would kick in. Sometimes he drank too much. He, you know, um, he, you know, but there was this wonderful kindness and sweetness. And I mean, he was a tough, funny kid. There were 2000 kids went to people showed up in his wake. Um, 2000. So <clears throat> I, uh, I moved him over I, I, and I stopped that day and, uh, and planted shamrock seeds. So when I got an Andrew office. He said, your son's here and he's beautiful. He looks like Brad Pitt, which he does. Mm. But, Chris is, 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 is commenting and stating that you're wearing the bracelet he gave you. And he's saying that you planted something at his grave. Mm -hmm. It was 45 minutes before I had done that. Yeah. And that was the moment, you know, Von, that it went from believing to knowing. And our relationship with Andrew has continued on to this day. In fact, I'm on the first, I don't like spirit circles. I'm not a spirit circle guy, but I love Andrew. And so I'll go out to the circle just to maybe be more of service to somebody else than to myself. Um, and that's a difference. You know, it, it wasn't like I was a bad guy or a pirate, but I was a lot more selfish prior to January 3rd, 2016 than I am now. Mm -hmm. And service is important. And if I can extend a kindness or a help, you know, I'm going to do it. You know, there's a, a there was a great uh, poem by Haruki Murakami. And once again, I don't look like a Haruki Murakami type poem guy, but I am. It's what's inside, Joe. Yeah, you look great. I think you're great. I think this is great all coming from you. Yeah. I think it's important. And Chris tells me this all the time. He said, Dad, you're a great ambassador. Yes. Because you don't look like the type of person that would be involved in this. And that will yes. allow other fathers specifically to identify with you. Yes, because it also takes a lot of emotion yes. to uh, do this work, to go be to be vulnerable with your pain, your story. And yes, we need more fathers. You know, yeah. just to tell the other fathers they can drop the rock. It's OK. Yeah. You want to, you know, I, I'm. I was a pretty tough kid, you know, but yeah. if I want to cry, I'm going to cry. And I don't care okay. if anybody. Is. Yeah, I do. Here's the quote. And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain. When you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what storms are all about. And the storm that every one of us that we're talking to mm -hmm. has, has walked through, has survived, changes mm -hmm. us. And mm -hmm. if it doesn't change us, maybe it's a waste. So I wasn't about to let this horrible tragedy, that uh, was a bell that couldn't be unrung, but I wasn't going to let it go to waste. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You know, so my mission is to bring Chris's messages to parents who've lost kids. Yeah. You know, the brilliant Susan Geisman wrote a book entitled Still Right Here. And that's the message. 
your mm-hmm. kids, your loved one, your significant other, your fiance, your wife, your husband, they're still right here. Yes, yes. But you need to do the work. You know, circling back to that well-met theater thing, I would say you need to do the work. You got to raise your level of consciousness. You got to do a little research. I mean, yes. I just recently, I'm, I'm, you know, six and a half years, almost seven years into this now. And I just did my first past life regression. Yeah. I'm expanding the horizon. Anything yeah. that'll bring me closer or give me more knowledge to what yeah. Christopher's doing, I'm, I'm in. I want part of. You know? Yeah. It's a lifelong journey. And so I've been in metaphysics 40 years now and spiritual practice for 40 years. And um, as, uh, as I said, um, I had to rethink everything uh, in time uh, when my daughter died. So I ended up, as I said, um, becoming an angel therapy practitioner and uh, certifying under Doreen Virtue, who was working in it at the time, and um, went to California. My sister accompanied me because I could, it was nine months after my daughter, uh, Jenea, died, and I could, I, I was terrified of the world, you know, like terrified. I, like you, was an A-plus personality, lived a charmed life, you know, everything was great. I have one surviving son. My my family was my world. I did stuff on my own as well. Work didn't work. You know, I had time to be at home with the kids if I wanted that sort of thing. But you know, her her passing, and in our case, it was a suicide. However, I don't get. I've I've met a lot of bereaved parents over the years, and we don't get caught up in how did your your child die. We don't. They're just gone, and the pain's the pain, the suffering's the suffering, the healing's the healing. However, we choose to do it, but we do need community. We do need stories. We do need better support. I'm in Canada. Support is not great for us here. I've talked to uh, Americans. They said I just had a, a newly bereaved mom on the show. And I asked her about support, and she agrees it's still the same as, you know, when I was comparing my experiences 17 years ago, it's still relatively the same. Also, not all bereaved parents take up support. They don't go to support groups. But even when they do, support can be lacking uh, practical positive steps to actually, you know, I'm going to loosely say heal, okay? Some some people don't like that word, and when when you're in grief and 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 it takes a while to kind of embrace the notion of healing, but just to be better than you were the day before. Because the other thing about this this really crappy grief, Joe, is that I read very early on, like within days, weeks, that it could be harder the longer you're in it, and I was like, no, please, please, God, no, but it's true. And I hate to say it, but it's not, it's not long lasting, but that pain can rack you at 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And I like learning from, you know, parents who have been in it, you know, 25, 30 years, but the supply of uh, books and things like that is kind of limited. And when we said earlier, I, I said earlier, we need more fathers. We also need, no, you know, more mum voices in this world because while there are, is a smidgen of bereaved parents that will uh, be public uh, about their journey, uh, we need way more. We need, we, we need way more. But, There's a know. wonderful uh, group called Helping Parents Heal. Mm. And, and Elizabeth Bassan in, in Phoenix started it when she lost her boy who was mm-hmm. hiking. Mm-hmm. And I was honored, I mean, the two, uh, uh, to go out and speak at their conference. I was honored to be asked with the heavyweights there. But it's, it's I contribute often to the, to the group and, and, and get feedback and, and get back a lot from the group. Because mm-hmm. it's, you know, the nice thing is, you never have, you know, you never have to explain yourself to, exactly. to a group of parents, right? Let me explain how this feels, because we know how this feels. You know, I do want to touch base on on the suicide aspect because quite often we kind of just dash by it. And, and I completely agree with you that, that crossing is crossing is crossing, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you cross from a disease an illness, you know, you get over and you get cleansed of that. And the same thing, I think the depression or anxiety, which or the madness that causes you to take your own life, you're, Mm -hmm. you're, you're relieved of that when you cross over, Mm -hmm. you know, it's all the same thing, but what's not the same thing is the, the, you know, and and I talk about this when I'm talking to parents, is if you've lost a child through suicide, there's an additional burden of guilt you put on yourself that's completely unearned, right? There's nothing you could do about it. You know, 
Well, I know, I know all about it. My, I, I just published a book in 2021 called Lessons in Surviving Suicide, which is strictly, I saw it. oh yeah, so that's strictly, it's not strictly for bereaved parents who have gone through suicide, but there were times I felt out of place in the Compassionate Friends Support Group, for example, because you're sitting there trying to justify to yourself, you see the pain of an accident or, you know, disease, something that in some small way makes sense. You understand this happened, it makes sense that my child died as a result of it. But when they choose to go, and I don't touch murder, but when they choose to go, it's like you you really almost can never fathom it. But I want to ask you something. I want to jump in and ask you something because you're speaking so eloquently and wonder, wonderfully about you know the metaphysics, the spiritual practice, and so on. Do you believe in heaven? You're raised Catholic. I just want to know, and, and now, now listen, I, there's a reason I'm asking this. So I, even with a background in, uh, in what I've already talked about, what, what we're talking about, metaphysics, ongoing consciousness, you know, more, 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 more than, than the human experience, grew up Christian and um, was raised somewhat in a Baptist church. And um, I didn't stick with it, but you know, so, but because I was this like sort of yearning soul that even from say my teen teen years knew there had to be more and I would look at the sky and and you know what's there what's there well anyway when Janae died even me with all of that background and practice you know thought about heaven not a place that I couldn't reach but really what was it not unlike were you saying well where do where do we go what is the af- what is the afterlife so I want to know if you believe in it, and then I'll tell you how I came to define heaven, because a lot of parents do believe in uh, heaven, and heaven, that word, I was talking to my sister yesterday, and I said, you know, it's such a, it's such a comforting word, heaven, and she said, it's a beautiful word, and I said, yes, it is, and to me, it's the same as the afterlife, but I just... Did you grapple with that? I, I'm sure raised a Catholic, you had to believe in heaven and hell. Did you? But Catholic faith and I, you know, we 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 cross our paths, we merge, oh. we separate. You know, <laughs> I'm a big okay. fan of Christ. I'm a big fan of Buddha. I'm a big fan of yeah. Isa. I'm a big yeah. fan of of all of the, uh, the ascended masters. Yeah. You know, I believe that we're all children of Christ, sons and God. I mean, of God. Yeah. Christ might be, you know, one of the favorite sons, along with Buddha and whoever. Right. So I have no issues with with the data. I believe Christopher refers to him as the source. So I refer to him as the source. Yeah. Yeah. So here's what Christopher told me about heaven. He said, Dad, your side's good. And he talks about it as his side. Mm-hmm. Your side's good. You know, he said it was like when you played football, you go to football camp. It's a lot of hard work. There's injuries. There's, you know, you're sweating, you're hit, you're physically, you're exhausted, but you're with your friends, you're competing and, and, and you're, 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 you're good. He said, your side's like that. It's, it's, it's good, but it's a lot of work. He mm-hmm. said, my side is a beach bungalow in Maui. My side's mm-hmm. better. So what I have come to the conclusion. So my knowing, it may not be your knowing, it may not be your, your people's, uh, you know, in, in the, in the cast, in the podcast knowing, but, but my knowing is that your heaven, you design it. Yes. Oh, I agree with that. Family, my family's mm-hmm. huge and they're all together. And I've had mediums, Thomas John named five of them. Mm-hmm. They were all came to a reading with 300 people. Mm-hmm. And, and he started talking. He said, who's there's a guy named Jerry, but it's not Gerald. And there's Pat and there's Bobby who took his life in the seventies and there's Billy. And then there's a son named Chris. And, you mm-hmm. know, so mm-hmm. it was, uh, it was like, bam, 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 bam. Uh, you know, he pulled me out of 300 people, right. Mm-hmm. Named everybody there. So I know they're all together. Yeah. I've, I've been told, you know, more than once when family members have come through to mediums that, you know, didn't know them or not know anything about them. So I, I do think it's a family group unless you don't want to be with your family yes ellie's ellie's dad was an avid uh he was a businessman but he loved the upland game hunt bird hunt and so he's come through a couple times and Mm. and you know and he's come through and both times medium said he's you know dressed like in in, you know like a hunting jacket walking through the fields that's Mm -hmm. his habit Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah sounds okay but that's not my heaven my heaven's more like chris's and tropical and 
and and huts and and maybe a golf course you know so i think that is you know it's like going to the you you you're going on this amazing vacation for as long as you want to stay there yeah you know, and if you want to come back to earth school you can and if you yeah. don't you don't yeah so i'll just add so for me whether you call it heaven the afterlife ongoing consciousness it's all the same uh something that helped me understand it because when you're when you're bereaved and you're looking for your loved one, whether it's your child or an, another, you know, uh, difficult loss that you're having trouble dealing with, and you're looking at that sky, where are you, where are you, where are you? Um, I, I came to understand it through a book I read, which I, you know, can't remember what it was at this moment, doesn't matter, it just as energy, and it's the field around us, and it's literally within inches, and we can just touch it. And so, and so, yeah, it's there. It's there. It's not that it's here too. It's here. It's just, it's, it's us. It's, it's a a little bit of it is in each of us, which is our ongoing consciousness. I just want to say really quickly, there's an article I, I, um, didn't have a chance to, uh, read it and access it yet, but science is now looking into, it's not that they haven't, it's, it's not that they have not had, um, you know, scientists, you know, n- not looking into ongoing consciousness. They've been doing tests for decades on this. But um, once it gets a little bit more in the mainstream, uh, you know, quantum physics and all that stuff, I think it'll be easier for people to believe and understand and even embrace the ability we have to tap into just another energy field just another, another vibration. So that ultimately is heaven and afterlife for me. Yes, I believe in heaven. Yeah. Yes, I believe in God and it's whatever name you put to God. Yeah. We, we don't we, we don't no no one religion owns the rights to who runs heaven. It's no. the source who put exactly. it all together. Exactly. You know? I want to say one quick experience uh very quick for the audience and and you might be interested in this as well, Joe. You said you had your first past life regression. Um, so many years ago, my daughter was, um, let me see. Um, oh, man. She was, I think, two or three. And uh, anyway, I was working at that time with, uh, and she would be turning 40 in February. So we're going back a few years. And so anyway, uh, I was working with the spiritual teacher at the time, and um, he had a new age center. And it was very, very like, woo, woo, but you know, for a lot of people, but it it actually kind of got me my start in my uh, mid 20s. And anyway, we did a past life regression. And just to keep this really, really short, I ended up sitting in a bright, the bright light, uh, you know, white light, what they talk about in near death experience and so on, what felt like at the hem of, we'll just call it, quote, God's feet. And it impacted me. I've never forgotten it. I've never forgotten the feeling. But I ultimately, just like when you went to a medium 15 years before Chris passed, it sort of set the um, the stage, if you will, set the whatever for I understood and had experienced there was something more, even though it wasn't a near-death experience. It was that type of feeling. So it made it easier for me to trust and understand Janae's communication and connection when she she came through hours after her death. In fact, in fact, there was a beautiful double rainbow uh, that became very symbolic uh, and significant in the first few years uh, that she sent, as well as other many many other things. I wanted to quickly ask you here. Um, so, your the focus of this episode, in, in in addition to all this other stuff we're talking about, but is the fact that you are able to communicate with Chris. Chris Chris has brought wonderful, beautiful messages that are in um, uh, both your books, uh, which we're going to be talking about that towards the end. But um, and having links to your website and and uh, books and so on. My search for Christopher on the other side, first book, the second book, we're not done yet. Pop my lessons from the other side. But my question to you as we're chatting here is what was the moment or did you trust right from the beginning Chris's connection and communication because of, of like at what moment did you trust? Uh, the question really is at what moment did you trust yourself to be receiving what was without a doubt Chris's communication? Without a doubt. And so it came in a little bit of levels, right? June June 30th, 2016, Andrew Anderson, I now knew that the other side existed. Chris was there. He could connect with me. Right. And, yeah. Story. Yeah. and, and so fast forward uh, on the anniversary of his death. 
uh, his crossing. I don't like to use the term death because he didn't die. Yeah. Uh, his, his crossing, January 3rd. To, now it's January 3rd, 2017. Now, during this period uh, prior to this, just prior, I had started getting up in the middle of the night and coming in to hit my office, which was his, his room, lighting mm-hmm. sage, aligning my chakras, breathing out, holding my breath for seven seconds, saying his name at each chakra level, burning sage, crystals, picture of him, candles, listening to the various guided meditations just to feel close to him. Mm -hmm. And I could, I felt really close to him and it was a really warm and comforting feeling. And on the anniversary uh, of his, (laughs) of, of that, I was here doing my thing. Right. And I started getting feedbacks in my head. And I had a legal pad like I do on my desk in front of me with a pen, a big mm-hmm. velocity pen. So I always use the same pen. And and all of a sudden I started getting these messages and I started writing them down. Now, prior to this, anytime I went to a medium, I would take notes or then started recording them and then transcribing them, put them in a tickler file according to date. I did that anticipating that someday sitting on a rocking chair, smoking a cigar, it would just help me feel close to Chris. Hmm. Chris had me doing that because he knew he wanted me to write a book, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was just following the breadcrumbs at this point. Sneaky Chris. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so the first message, all of a sudden I pick up a pen and he said, it's like a beach. It's beautiful, pink, warm, but the colors are soft and vibrant, pink, blues, and strong greens. The air is warm surrounding us. It's air and love. It's love air everywhere. Nothing Mm -hmm. hurts. Warm and happy. Always young. Miss you, dad, but I'll see you soon enough. Then he talked about his friend. He said, you got to let go of the resentment. You know, Scotty was my friend. I loved him and he loved me. We were buddies. And that was about that. I was a year later still carrying on the resentment for the the people that owned the lake house. Now, you know, they were a little lax and, and, Permissive yeah. possible, but they were 21 year old boys. These weren't babies. They yeah. made choices, but I was angry and I wanted to be mad at somebody. So I was mad at them. And he said, you got to let go of that. And I was like, you know, well, okay for you, Chris, anything, I'll let go of that. And I thought, besides in the back of my mind, I'm thinking this is easy. When will I see this kid again? So, so this one, on, I wrote about two, three pages that day. And that continues. This happened at three o'clock this morning, by the way. Mm. I had a visit with Chris from nice. three o'clock this morning. And nice. So this continues at least a couple of times a month where we connect just him and I here. Mm-hmm. And people say, ask him this question. And this isn't a Q and A. When I go to a medium, I'll do a Q and A. This mm. is him dictating, him yes. telling me, I'm not going to break the string and ask him anything. I'm going to take down what my boy is telling me mm-hmm. for the good of me, for the good of the family, for the good of mankind, for the good of parents who've lost kids. So I said, sure, Chris, I'll let go of this resentment of Scotty. And uh, so then the, 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 I went back to bed and Sally and I were going to meet at the grave at sundown and launch a Chinese lantern and honor our boy. Uh, but instead, uh, I got a, uh, a text from some of his friends that said, hey, Pop, or, or Mr. McHugh, it's Chris's, you know, his was college buddies who are in our lives and very close friends to this to this day. And he said, well, you know, a couple of us are going to meet at Chris's grave about 3.30. Can you meet us? I said, sure. So I grabbed the hockey cooler, threw a bunch of ice and Gatorade and grabbed a bunch of cigars and figured, you know, five or six of us would hang out and kind of just talk about Chris and love each other. When I got there, there were about 40 kids there. Mm-hmm. Nice. From his grammar school to his middle school to his high school to his college. Um, they got in that coconut telegraph the kids got. You know, and we sat there for two hours in the, and I called Sally. I said, you got to get here, you know, two hours in, in the, the North shore of Chicago in the middle in early January, it was cold. And we've done that every year since, by the way. And, uh, and the first kid that I saw there was Scotty. So mm-hmm. all of a sudden it dawned on me, Ron, that he was preparing me for this meeting. Yeah. He had he asked me a favor. Let yeah. go of the resentment. So by the yeah. time I saw him, I was able to, I wasn't ducking him or, or blaming him. I was able to embrace him and say, it wasn't your fault. You know, yeah. Yeah. I love you, you know? Yeah. And, and those messages continue to this day. Yeah. Um, and so I've written down everyone exactly as he's told me. If it's misspelled, then it goes in there misspelled. If it's yeah. 
you know, if, you know, if it, I, I write down, you know, when you get messages from the other side, you don't yes. edit them. One thing I wanted to ask you here uh, now, again, you may not have thought of this. And if you have, you may not want to answer it, but it, the, here goes the question. Here goes the question. So, here goes the question. So um, I have two, actually. One is over the years, because Chris has been channeling, you know, for a few years now, have the messages uh, deepened, in, evolved, changed as your understanding and awareness to embrace, in, embrace information changes? And the second thing is, um, have you considered that one day you may not need Chris as much or Chris will need to move on and not be uh, as frequent a communicator with you. Have you thought about that? I have, and I've addressed them both. And okay. so let's start with, uh, you know, the, the, the first question is evolving. You know, there's, yeah. there's, there's less funny. Yeah. Less yeah. cursing, <laughs> Oh, you know, um, and he's and, and and so he's evolving, but he said to me, uh, Early on, he said, Pop, I'm moving from one level to another, but it okay. won't affect our relationship. He said, mm -hmm. it's like me calling you from Phoenix or Tucson or yeah. from Los Angeles. The reception is the same. So that won't change. So don't worry about that. And then I also was worried about the second part, second question, which is a great question. As I was finishing the first book and I was finishing it and and. I was feeling a little melancholy because Chris was with me for every keystroke, every paragraph. He inspired every word that was written. And I thought, wow, if I'm done with this and where project is over, will that mean the closeness will dissipate? Mm -hmm. And it scared the heck out of me. And it made me sad. And hence the name for the second book. He came to me and said, you know, we're not done yet, Pop. We'll be writing until you cross. Okay. And so yeah. the bottom line is, no, I know that Chris has another job over there, but he also explained to me that I'm not taking him from anything. Yeah. He can be with me and do what we're doing and still yeah. you know, doing, learning, caring, growing, helping on the other side. Yeah. So I, you know, that was something I worried about was, am I holding him back? Yeah. But I know he's a very evolved spirit and he's an old, yeah. old soul. So a, I know we'll be together until he crosses. And he's told me what my crossing is going to look like. He said, it'd be like walking through the woods pop. Mm -hmm. And there's a little stream and you're going to have to step over to see, to get to me. He said, I can't bring you across. You got to step over on your own. But once you do, we'll be together again mm -hmm. forever. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. You know, I also feared, you know, him crossing on the metaphysical on the highway, me going, him coming back until Bob Olson made it clear to me in his book that, you know, spirit, the spirit of Chris McQuillan, son of Joseph will stay on the other side, even though from that same soul, another Chris McQuillan wave could come back and be a father. Mm -hmm. But my son will be with me when we cross uh, together. That's really interesting. I want to just pursue that uh, briefly here. Uh, because I was going to ask you if you believed in reincarnation, you clearly do. Um, and whether that was literally going to be my question, whether you worried, because I did, that they might come back after work, like, like they might come back to somebody else while we're here. On the highway when we're going the other way. Yeah. Exactly. And so how does Bob Olson explain that? Is that a piece, like a piece of the soul, a piece of their spirit stays there? That's exactly. Think of, he said, think of a body of water. Yeah. Lake Michigan forever. I'm on the middle lake, right? Yeah. He said, so all our souls are connected, but your soul is a big body of water. Out of your soul are waves, which is your spirit. Okay. So the spirit of Christopher McQuillan may have a bunch of spirits because that body of water has a bunch of waves. But the spirit that'll come back, which I believe will be Chris wanting to be a father, come back, won't, won't take away from the spirit that is my I, son. I get it. On the other side. I get it. And, and they're still connected. Still one it. body of water. Yeah. And that I, cleared it up for me. Yeah. I'm going to um, consider that uh, because uh, I believe that people are gifted with information and can share it for, you know, 
and we receive information that we're ready to receive. And all of that happens in the timing that we're ready to receive it. And it can get pretty intense the more evolved and open we become consciously. And um, I also believe our loved ones, our children, be they our children, who are evolved enough, and I agree with you, they have to be evolved enough to be able to come down and get in at our level and you know we raise up they come down uh, from everything I've learned and it certainly seems that way because my daughter all of her connecting with me I have had physical actual physical visits from her can't get I can't get into it but um, many many healings uh, all sorts and not I'm not talking about signs I'm talking about real visits using human human vehicles for them I didn't know it at the time and I so regret not knowing it. And I wish I, could, I wish I had time to tell the story, but I can't. And I'll just briefly say her best friend passed five years after her and from a brain tumor. And all I will say is when I was doing my book signing in 2012 for my first book, Divine Healing, both the girls came to visit me at the age that they met. And... Um, picked up my book, and although we were making small talk uh, towards the end, I kind of got them to go away because I thought it was just the oddest thing I've ever seen in my life is two young girls at about age, you know, 12, speaking to an author about a book that was way beyond their capacity. And they picked it up, and I did not know her best friend had died at that point. She had died two years earlier, and I, I did not know that. We had lost contact. I And... They picked up the book and they said, we think our moms would really like this. Yeah. And I was like, what? So I was like, girls, are your moms in the... We, I was in a bookstore, like a Barnes and Noble store, but we're in Canada, so it was chapters. And girls, like, maybe you should go find your moms. And you know, Anyway, it was the most awkward, 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 awkward exchange. And it, at dinner that night, I said to my husband, I believe, you know, her, her best friend, uh, her name by name, uh, you know, had died. And sure enough, we found out a few months later that had actually uh, happened. So it was an actual visit from those two girls. And it, and so, you know, it's like you don't always know what's happening when it's happening, audience. And I'm sure Joe will attest to it. And I want to get to signs towards the end of this. But just I wanted to just clear up that because I am going to think about this because... My daughter did show me the council. I don't know if you have gotten enough into your, uh, you know, spiritual stuff about the council. Yes. Well, she showed it to me in 2014 and told me she was coming back. And I had long suspected she would come back. She's not here yet. I'm just saying I have grappled with, well, what if she came back to someone else? But I have never considered a piece of her, a piece of that spirit um, will still be there when I cross. That's exactly now, what I believe. So um, I'm going to think about that one. And so thank you for sharing. Um, I learned something. I, I learned something new, and it's hard. To, it's hard for me to learn something new at this point in my journey. But anyway, and not to sound arrogant or anything. It's just if you're at this long enough, the same information gets circulated. Is what I'm trying to say. Um, now I have to turn very quickly to a question. Sure. That is. Um, You've had this wonderful ongoing uh, communication connection messages with Christopher, and it is absolutely blessed. Um, I've, I've had them. I had them for a number of years and around for me, year 10, because of my own journey and what I'm here to do and whatever, those visits became less. But I will tell you, if I ask my daughter and say, "Hun, I really need to see you. I just need something. She will come to me, and it always usually uh, transpires uh, as an astral visit. And an astral visit for audience that may not understand that, it is like a dream visit, but it is not a dream. They, uh, she is always deceased, um, well, in spirit, let's put it that way, um, always young and and that you know, like the age she she passed, she hasn't aged from it, and she always has a message. But what was interesting in the last visit, which was recently, maybe a couple months ago, she allowed me to hug her. And we have never had a physical connection before. It has always been, for lack of a better word, telepathic. So that was extremely interesting. But the other thing about this is 
the what can be the pain associated with some of these visits. Have you experienced that, Joe? And and for parents out there really desperately wanting to connect, maybe they are connecting. I have found that certainly in my earlier years that these visits were a double-edged sword. They could be, well, absolutely miraculous. They could also, you have to deal with the humanness of the loss as well. So my question is, how do you balance this fabulous experience that lasts for however many minutes or whatever, and then you come back and you still have to be in this human body with this human pain? I, you know, I'm, as soon as I finish with you, I'm jumping in the car and hanging down. You know, I'm a mortgage broker and I go down to the office and 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 get involved in the other side of the world. A couple of things. One, my I was put on this path. This wasn't my choice. And I'm so grateful for it. Because I think I think my heart would be really empty if I didn't have this. Now, and it's only from a parent who's understands, as you do, that. I, you know, I had a session, as I said, with three o'clock in the morning with Chris and the day after I'm a little sad. I miss him. My son, William, who's uh, 23, uh, lives in Boulder. He and his girlfriend came back for Thanksgiving. I took him to the airport late to, last night mm-hmm. and I miss him already. It's like, well, you know, you just had him for a weekend. Shouldn't you be content? Well, yeah, yeah but that also triggers that missing that familiarity, you know? So yeah. what I do, I'm going to be honest with you when I, start to feel sorry for myself is I answer emails from parents who've lost kids. You know, we just did a session with Jeff Mara that had, you know, 30,000 views on it. And I had given my email, which I will here at jbmcquillan at gmail.com. And most of them wanted, I do a thing called steps for connecting and I do a a chakra chart that I send them. And it just helps put people on that, on that, that road. But I did. And then I have a, uh, we do a golf outing for Chris in September and my friends come from family come from all over the country. You know, it's amazing. Oh my God. It's so amazing. But I have this, you know, my heart gets empty, you know, cause yeah. it's when it's over and, you yeah. know, I feel Chris around and know he's around. And, and so I, of course I do. When I have that three o'clock session, as I did this morning, a day like today, I'm a little less, you know, um, maybe vibrant. Right. Mm-hmm. But what I do is, is, throw myself into service. You know, I live my life two ways and it's not the way I lived my life before. I live my life to please my God and to make my son proud. Mm -hmm. So I know when I'm answering, you know, emails, dozens, you know, of emails that I'm, that I'm making him proud of me and maybe, you know, helping another parent, maybe heal or have faith or belief, you know, that's a good deal. So yeah, I do. When I've had these connections, there's always a little bit of a hangover the next day. Yeah. And I, and thank you. Thank you for being honest and sharing that because um, I know that uh, for me, uh, it, it, yes, it impacts me as, as well. I'm a big one for healing. I have two questions left for you um, and I appreciate your time. What are your views on healing? So it's, it's, not, it's not unusual to hear that losing a child is described certainly in North America as the worst loss to bear. I've always considered, oh, there might, maybe there's something else out there, but I don't know what it is. And so what is your view? Uh, and if you want to describe it in ter- terms of personal goals or just general for other, for other bereaved parents thinking about this, what's your, your view on, on having a goal towards fully healing from this experience? This is the crossroads that I've been grappling with for the last, uh, say, since 2018. And so I deal, all my work is, is largely in that arena, is heal what you can, but it's about the choice about how you want to live. But whether or not fully attaining healing, attaining, you know, full and complete healing. I got this. I'm okay that my child died. I'm going to just rock my life until my deathbed. You know, sometimes I'll say, I think that goal might be a bit lofty for me. It's still a goal uh, because spiritually, the reason I'm asking this is because spiritually all things happen in divine order and timing, right? So how do we coincide? How do we, you know, do you know have make that uh integrate that live that what are your views on that do we go after the healing what do we do joe 
I think it's, you know, it's a wonderful aspiration. You know, okay. we should, you know, and try as you might, there'll always be a piece of your heart broken mm-hmm. if you lost a child. I mean, that's just the way it is. You know, um, it's not like getting remarried or going to get another dog or, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's an entirely different ball game. Now, yeah. sometimes I have to but dial it back and realize grief is grief. You know, my best friend lost his, his wife and his, and, and they were amazingly close, you know, 18 years ago. And she'll, you know, and he got remarried, but she's always going to be part of his life and his, and he adores her. And, and mm-hmm. she's waiting for him when he crosses. So what do I think? I think that I'm okay dealing with the pain. And the reason I'm okay now, I'm not running around in pain all the time. But mm-hmm. when the pain hits, it's directly proportionate to the love that I have for that boy. So when I'm sitting there and thinking of picking him up for Thanksgiving, but I'm not, right? Or mm-hmm. bringing him home to the airport, but I'm not, I allow myself to feel pain and cry. And, and it's like a tsunami. It goes back out, right? You gotta, well, it's when you try to hold it in. And as I said, I've lived a life beyond my wildest dreams. Very full, very mm-hmm. wonderful. You know, and and I have wonderful friends. I love to golf. I'm too old to play hockey anymore. I have a great relationship with people. Very blessed, you know, but a piece of me is always going to walk through life with a piece of my heart broken. And if people don't understand that, I'm not there to convert them. If this is too much out of your wheelhouse, then leave my life. You know, yeah. I came from a very loving, dysfunctional, fairly but loving. And somebody once gave me the quote that said, the unassailable self-confidence that comes from a childhood insulated with love. I grew up being loved. I'm still loved by my family. I love my family. Most of them, a bunch of them are on the other side and there's new ones coming up and I adore my family, you know, but that's the only thing that really mattered to me was family and dear friends. So if somebody Mm -hmm. on the outside doesn't understand my grief or my path, you know, shake them off, man. You know, yeah. it's like Christ said in Matthew, right? Like dust, you know, shake it off like dust from your sandals. You know, I'm here to reach parents who need to know that it's not over and yeah. that they can connect. Now, as you know, it's a terrible deal. It's a bad trade. I'd rather <laughs> be completely yeah. abysmally ignorant of the metaphysical and, 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 and go with a pizza and go bowling with my kid tonight. I've said that. I've said that before, uh, Joe. Oh, not our choice. That's not our purpose. And yeah, it, yeah. I don't think God didn't take our child. You know, there's a great Me line either. from the book, The Shack. And a woman who played God said to a guy who lost a, a daughter, just because I work incredible good out of unspeakable tragedies doesn't mean I orchestrated the tragedies. God didn't pull the rug out from under me or right. my son. Yeah, and I just want to pop in for any bereaved person, parent out there uh, that will uh, listen or watch this, is that I personally never blamed God. Um, I accepted the divine right timing and all that stuff from the beginning, but um, it it is understandable that one would want to do that, and it's okay, and I'm a big, big big practitioner, teacher of, and a believer in letting things just happen. Feel your emotions, feel your anger, acknowledge it, you know, and just go through it instead of trying to tell yourself that you're not this, you're not that, and all the rest of it. But that's another episode. And here's a great story about God. Probably my last one, right? You know, the, the days after Christopher drowned were full of arrangements and, 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 and funeral plots and, and, and receptions and, and churches and masses and all of that, right? So I was exhausted at the end of each of those nights, you know, and his body being shipped back from Wisconsin because it was mm-hmm. from one state to another. I'd get on my knees and I'd say, I thank God for my family, my sobriety. But I would say, you and I are not good. You took my kid. And then I'd go to bed. And this happened for three nights. And on the third night, I got a download, which is, you know, kind of unusual that said, I didn't take your son. His recklessness and free will caused him to come home early. And I welcomed him home. And remember, I lost a son too. It was at that point, Von, that I knew God wasn't this vengeful, 
ringmaster, you know, making us jump to his beat, or I wasn't paying for my sins of the past by taking my son, that Christopher's free will caused him to put himself in, a, in peril. And that he, he sat there hugging me in my grief. And so my relationship with God changed that day to where I really knew that he was a loving father and my son was in his world and he'd be okay. Yeah. And I've never wavered from that. I'm a big fan of God. One thing to consider here, and um, I don't know if you've come across this type of teaching, Joe, but is that uh, some spiritual practitioners, authors, again, we're talking the ones that, you know, were quite prominent uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and so on, uh, talked about exit points. And we have, um, you know, various number of exit points. If one were to choose to believe that, I do. and um, looking back at my daughter, I know she missed one exit point, and it took maybe the second or maybe the third. So one can consider these exit points, free will, same kind of thing, and how it's, it wraps it back to, uh, or takes it back to how they choose to go, how any of us choose to go. That's not the point. The, the point is we, we choose our transition. And, and that, I think we've had a soul contract. Yes, I, that, I, yes, yes, soul contract for sure. And I know what mine is. I may not like it and you may not like yours. Uh, you know, and other people may not like theirs. But when you understand what that is for you, it doesn't matter what other people tell you. Medium, psychics, doesn't matter as long as you understand what that contract would be. Uh, and this might be a, a, a bit for some audience members watching right now, and others might be going, yes, yes, let's talk about soul contracts. I think they're very, very much a part of the uh, overall experience. Last thing I just want to quickly say, and you may have uh, something you want to offer and comfort brief parents, I will remind um, the audience, Joe has his two books. I'm going to have links to those to his website where he's got other material to uh, it may resonate with you for practices and tips on how to open yourself up uh, to channel. There are many ways to get to uh, open, you know, open expanded consciousness, and we're always uh, uh, being asked to keep opening it. Uh, there's not one point where you go, yeah, I'm done. I I'm fully expanded. No, this is a lifelong journey. And the other thing I have always said for many years is once you have awareness, you can't turn it off. So the minute you commit to going down this path, and like Joe says, you know, having to do the work, it's a commitment to being more than who we are in just this physical form, and you can't turn it off, okay? You can choose what you want to do with it, but, but you can't say any more that you didn't know. So I just, want to put, I, want to, I just want to put that out there. The other thing is, consider you may already be having a child or loved one on the other side who is trying to communicate with you and struggling. I did a week with James von Prague in 2015, September. It was amazing, amazing. And we all just channeled for five days. And that's what we did. And if you did it, you did it. And if you couldn't do it, well, I guess you couldn't do it. And it turned out I was pretty good at it. But I will say the vibration is much lower than angels. And I wasn't super comfortable with it because you're almost letting, this isn't channeling your child. This, no, Joe, I'm talking about strangers, right? And coming and using your body as a vehicle. And uh, so you'll never convince me anybody out there that poo poos this and calls it woo woo stuff. You'll never convince me we don't live forever in energy. And, um, you know, and, and we all have an ability. There were people at that, uh, at that week long event that actually didn't know why they were there. They misunderstood what it was about and turned out to be pretty good channels. Just want to say, so and anybody can do this. This is true. And as I said, Joe has the resources um, so that he uh, has developed. There are others out there, obviously, but um, check those out. The other thing I just want to say before we close out are signs. And I, I can't believe there's one bereaved parent or bereaved spouse or bereaved sibling or, you know, if, if you're open to it, that anybody bereaved that hasn't had a sign and well, I won't go into detail in any of them because we are at the top of the hour. Uh, for me, I just want to say it could be music, smells, feathers, coins, birds, animals, electronic malfunctions, um, you know, and I just wanted to ask, did you have any other things that people could understand? Yeah. And I've had, listen, I've had feathers in a wet shower, a dry feather in a wet shower. And for me, sometimes it's angels. Sometimes I have to think it's, it's my daughter, but she gave something on every anniversary. It might be a phone call from the area code she used to live in. 
and she doesn't do that anymore. But in the beginning, when we really need this connection and we're desperate for it, you know what? I really believe that every one of them tries. And just because just because you can't feel something doesn't mean that they haven't been trying. And James von Prague actually said they get tired of trying. And for channels like him, mediums like him, he might have a lineup of, of, of you know, those who have crossed waiting to try and almost butt the next person out. Um, so those, but those physical signs, they could be a start to just having the actual connection. Would you agree with that, Joe? I would also say don't doubt. You know, I, Christopher sends me cardinals and, and feathers. He yeah. sends Sally Hawks, different than me. And I'm just saying don't doubt. You can rational weigh things. You can do whatever you want to do, but buy in. And I would say, if it doesn't work, we'll refund your misery. You know, but but you gotta buy that. in. You know, I love and that. I do believe that your children or your loved one, they're like outside the window knocking. It's like, yes. dude, it annoys me when somebody says, "Well, I don't. I'm not good at meditating. We'll get better." You know, <laughs> if you want this gift, you yeah. know, and and my whole thing is, I believe I have this amazing gift that was given to me but I've got to give it away to keep it, right? So if I have this gift, you've got to buy in and do what you can. You got to raise your level of consciousness. They'll lower theirs and meet you in the middle. But if you're not doing your part, it isn't going to happen. And so there's nobody to blame except you. And by the way, this puts you on a metaphysical path that will heal your soul, that will help your heart heal, you know, a little bit. Right. So, yes, a lot, actually, a lot. I can attest to the power of the angels saving me, the power of my daughter coming through to save me. One last thing I want to say in my own case, not needing her as much. And I don't need, mean I consciously didn't need her. <laughs> it's like, I think maybe I'm not needing her as much. And I'm talking, you know, 14, 15, 16, whatever the, the time is for you. It's not that they're still not around. They can be here in a GIF. And like I said earlier, if I need her, she, she'll, she'll come to me. It might not be the same day, but she'll, she'll make sure she knows uh, that she's around. A visit and connection feels very different than anything you humanly experience. And I just want to say to that, for those that are quiz, was that a sign? Was that a sign? It's a sign and it's a visit if you feel that it was. I get chills on the back of my neck when Christopher's around. When yeah. I was doing this at 3 a.m., I got a full run, yeah. chills yeah. up and down my back. So intense, so strong. And the message, you know, has evolved. You asked me this. was Originally, it was messages to me. Yes. Now it's to me and other grieving parents. And it's about me doing service for them. So it shifted a little bit, you know, and he's using me as a vehicle, you know, to connect with parents. Well, I invited both kids to the session. So um, I did. And yeah, and oh, I'm getting chills right now, too. And so, uh, you know, I just said, hey, you want to drop in on the session? You know, your dad, Chris and honey, we're chatting about this. So um and uh, the other thing, it can you can see humor uh, in visits sometimes too, and their personality traits, and all of that stuff comes out, and it's so heartwarming. And I can attest, the longer I've been at this, and the more I just want it, because that I will. Uh, I've said last a couple of times, but this really is my last thing. We some of us have surviving children, and they cannot be, in my estimation, forgotten in this journey. So for those of us that have purpose work. Somebody recently said to me, it sounds like you're, you've let your loss define you. And I didn't, I wasn't upset. I was just oh, objective about it. And I thought, hmm. So I told my son, who's 30. And there was nine and a half years between my kids. And um, he goes, well, it's true. You have. And it stopped me and rocked me in my shoes because I am also trying to be very respectful and considerate because he does not talk about the grief at all what happened his sister died when he was 13 and um and so balancing making sure this purpose work this mission this drive that gets me out of bed in the morning and keeps me doing things even you know through sickness and through health to not let him feel any less because he's the one that survived 
And I was going to ask you about that, but I'm not sure I want to, or you even want to talk about that. But it's a fine balance between our commitment and wanting to be reunified, you know, with, with our, lo- our loved one on the afterlife and not letting our, our, our living human children feel that, that, that they aren't enough for us in some way. And I'm re- bringing that up, not personally for you, Joe, not personally for me, just as something that is a consideration uh, in bereavement. And, and I, I don't have the answers for it. I, I just don't. And I don't know. You can't get lost in your grief. And maybe one of the things that kept me going was knowing I had responsibility of two kids. William was 13 when Christopher transitioned. And, and, and so, you know, Caroline was, you know, like 19. And so everybody's got to grieve on their own, but come yeah. together with unified love. And I respect each of their paths, right? Yeah. And what I'm doing with you is, you know, my wife, of course, very, 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 you know, you know, understands and endorses and very, they don't listen to these podcasts. You know, I was telling yeah. them about it, you know, like, yeah. you know, and that's their choice. You yeah. Know, I, yeah. But, you know, but when they have questions about Chris or the other side, I'm very open to, you know, uh, the, the answer though. So it's, it's attraction rather than promotion. My family is my life, you know, yes. on both sides of the veil. Yeah, me too. Me too. And I'm just going to say, son, if you're watching, yay, uh, he might, he might watch some of this. He's definitely interested and supportive of my work, as is all my family. We're a very small family. But it's just, I want to let him know, and I'll publicly say right now, you are never second best. You're all right there in my heart. And I think Joe feels the same, with the same amount, if not more love than we had before, because the one thing losing a child does is it makes us love unconditionally. Well, certainly like I never did before. I, and I, we I, prioritize I, what's important. Yeah. So Joe... Fantastic. Thank you so much. I don't think I left anything out. Was there anything else I uh, that you wanted to say or do you think we covered it? Did we cover it? We covered it. And okay. People reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Something I can do to be of service, I will. Yeah. And remember, your kids are still right here. Exactly. So thank you so much again, Joe. It's been heartwarming talking to you. God bless. Okay.